Hello everyone, I'm Victoria Bradford. I'm one of the pediatric anesthesia attendings here at UK. I'm also the medical director for Safari, which is sedation and anesthesia for areas of remote intervention. So this is um, the first part of the series on sedation and analgesia. This first part, we are going to talk about the pre-sedation assessment, so which you will be completing um, before giving any sedative medications for a variety of outer OR procedures you may be asked to help with, say setting fractures in the ER, lumbar puncture, etc. So at the end of this lecture, our goals for you will be to understand the importance of the pre-sedation assessment, why um, we look for the things that we really put emphasis on. We're going to talk about the levels of sedation and we'll also identify what the Malampati scoring system means, one, two, three, four. We're going to correctly assign ASA status to some hypothetical patients. We'll talk about some conditions that place a patient at higher risk of complications related to sedation. And we'll also talk about appropriate NPO times. Most of my resources are from the anesthesiology um, ASA publication for practice guidelines for sedation and analgesia for non-anesthesiologists. So the sedation continuum, you know, you hear a lot of kind of vernacular lay terms of conscious sedation, twilight sleep, will get you to snooze, will get you to sleep, but really kind of most accurately is this sedation and you know on one hand you have very minimal which is also anxiolysis, the next step after that moderate sedation, deep sedation, and general anesthesia. General anesthesia is when the patient does not move to a painful stimulus. So general anesthesia can be achieved with a natural airway, with a laryngeal mask airway, um, or with an ET tube for respiratory support. The presence or absence of an airway does not dictate what your, um, of an airway device, what your level of sedation is. So anxiolysis is very minimal. Um, this is maybe a milligram or two of Versed. The patient is responding normally to voice. Respiratory function, cardiovascular function are not affected. And when you're performing sedation and analgesia, you should be prepared to rescue the patient from the next deepest level of anesthesia. So with anxiolysis, if the patient gets a little bit more sedated and crosses over into moderate, you should be prepared for that. Um, and that really becomes important as the sedation gets deeper. So conscious sedation is also um, referring to essentially moderate sedation or analgesia. You do have depression of consciousness, so this is people say, you know, twilight sleep. Patients may have amnesia to this. They may tell you, oh, they put me out for my EGD, and when you look back at the record, it might have just been Versed and fentanyl, but if the patient is amnestic to it, they may not be able to really give you that accurate of a description. So checking the old records is important. This is depression of consciousness, responds purposefully to voice or touch. 
the patient is adequately spontaneously ventilating so we're not obstructing we're not doing any airway interventions cardiovascular function blood pressures usually maintained So deep sedation refers to a patient that cannot easily be aroused. Uh, with repeated or painful stimuli, the patient will respond. So this is kind of the big defining feature. Now at this point, the patient may obstruct and require some airway assistance. Spontaneous ventilation may need to be augmented because it may be inadequate. Cardiovascular function, blood pressures, usually maintained. So our next level is general anesthesia. The patient is unconscious. They will not move to a painful stimulus. So this means that positive pressure ventilation, not just airway assistance, may be required. And also, you're going to see cardiovascular depression as well typically from loss of or decreased systemic vascular resistance. So you're going to see some lower blood pressures as well. So now that we've talked about the continuum of sedation, let's talk about what you need to know, your pre-sedation assessment. So the patient's medical history any big abnormalities of the major systems, cardiac, respiratory, neurological disease. What is their prior sedation and anesthesia experience? Um, a child with a chronic illness who comes very frequently for MRIs, for LPs, will have a different experience, also a different tolerance to um, medications and how they react to healthcare personnel as compared to someone who ha really has never had sedation or anesthesia. What is their surgical history? Drug allergies and medications to look for any interactions. Time of last oral intake. And this is important to ask and it's honestly important to ask it a couple times because I have had patients who tell the pre-op nurse, oh, I, I haven't had anything since midnight, and then I get there, or resident gets there, and oh, they remembered they had something else past midnight. So it's important to ask. Tobacco, you have to ask about because it's not just smoking cigarettes. There's vaping, there's jewel, there's also chewing tobacco, um, which can impact your NPO time. Uh, alcohol, substance use and abuse, and this gives you an idea of uh, the patient's current tolerance and any interactions. If a patient is suffering from alcoholism, you know they will likely have a much higher tolerance for a medication like midazolam than somebody who does not. So your next step would be a focused physical exam. Look at the airway. So you'll look for any reassuring or not reassuring findings. Um, you want to look at neck movement, neck extension, cardiac, uh, respiratory. Are they wheezing? Are they? Do they sound like they're obstructing at baseline? Neuro, are there any existing neurological deficits that you want to know about beforehand? If the patient, for example, has a history of stroke and has weakness on one side, or if the patient has neuropathies um, in, you know, maybe a diabetic distribution, that can tell you things that you need to be aware of um, for positioning. Um, patients who have diabetic neuropathy may also have autonomic neuropathy as well and gastroparesis. They're already having sequelae of their diabetes when they tell you about the neuropathy. So the next thing to look at would be do they have kidney manifestations and gastroparesis.
and other systems as indicated by the patient or the procedure. So the Malampati classification was, not surprisingly, published by Dr. Malampati. It's a way of describing the patient's airway um, on its own. It's not really, uh, really that standalone useful to predict if this patient will be difficult or not, but taken in with your other airway findings. Uh, it can be a predictor for difficult mask ventilation and difficult intubation. So you ask the patient to sit up straight, mouth open, tongue out all the way, and do not ask the patient to say ah, because this can falsely improve your malampati. It elevates the palate and makes structures more visible. And that's not quite what you're looking for. You want to see what you can see with when they don't have that tone of the oral musculature. So malampati scores three and four suggest difficulty. So if you see this, if you have other non-reassuring findings, you may need to make sure you have help available. You may think a little bit differently about the depth of sedation that you will tolerate. And this um, is something to also discuss with the proceduralist that, you know, it may not be safe to get this person into a deep level of sedation versus if you can achieve it with uh, minimal or moderate sedation. So Malampati 1 is where the soft palate is completely visualized. You can see everything. Two, you can't see the tonsillar pillars. Three, you can't see the entire uvula. And four, they open their mouth and it just looks like tissue. So, other non-reassuring findings on exam, if you have real long prominent incisors or buck teeth, which may make airway instrumentation difficult if this patient needed either oral airway, LMA placement, laryngoscopy, severe over overbite for a similar reason. Limited jaw or neck mobility. So this means that if the patient begins to obstruct and you do jaw lift, it may not be as effective. Limited neck mobility can be an issue either in trauma, in a C-collar, or in patients with natural atlanoaxial instability, potentially Down syndrome, or rheumatoid arthritis. Anyone who's had prior neck fusion, they just won't extend their necks very well, and you don't want to crank back on them. A short neck, a sick neck, airway or neck mass, so many types of uh, tumors. Many of those patients have smoking histories or a large goiter and a short chin. Things you that can predict airway obstruction when you're just speaking with the patient and doing your exam. Prior anesthesia or sedation complications. Maybe the patient tells you, they said I didn't breathe so good afterward. That should be a hint. Sleep apnea, snoring. This is either for sleep apnea, I say either a documented or in your opinion, a presumptive diagnosis based on questioning or stop being criteria. Rheumatoid arthritis, again, tough neck mobility, and syndromes that are associated with airway obstruction. Trisomy 21, achondroplasia, Pierre Robin, Treacher Collins. Um, any syndrome that has mid face hypoplasia, um, large tongue, back with Wiedemann as well, um, things you see on exam, obesity, dysmorphic features, small mouth opening, micro or retronathia, 
and cervical spine disease or trauma, like we talked about earlier. So several syndromes that are associated with airway obstruction. Here we have Pierre Robin. You can see micronathia, retronathia. So the tongue basically occludes the airway. Apert syndrome is characterized by syndactyly. Pronathia, so you see the child has an underbite. Um, and they can have craniosynostosis as well, premature fusion of the cranial sutures. Treacher Collins, they are characterized um, in this syndrome, these patients with cleft palate um, and micronathia. And Down syndromes, uh, those children typically have sleep apnea and larger tongues. So once you've done history, physical exam, it's time to think about what labs and tests are necessary here. So review the existing chart and labs and when you're ordering labs or you say we need, we need to know this, we need to know that, kind of think about how it's going to change the management. Now, say for someone with end-stage renal disease, that really matters if their potassium is 4.5 versus 6 it may change your idea. If you need to get an EKG, if you see peak T waves, does this procedure even need to occur? Um, or did they just have dialysis and they're good to go, they're not fluid overloaded? So moving on, so moving on uh, to talk about NPO nil pros guidelines to reduce the risk of pulmonary aspiration. Now again, this is to reduce the risk, not to completely eliminate the risk. Um, this is from the ASA guidelines, and this is what we all go by. So for clear liquid, black coffee, no creamer, water, Gatorade, Pedialyte, apple juice, not orange juice, um, two hours of fasting, breast milk, four hours, infant formula, cow's milk, six hours, light light meal tea and toast this is their example so essentially carbohydrates and clear liquids six hours anything with fat or protein is eight hours so when we say patient needs to be NPO for eight hours that's because it's typically unreliable to know what exactly and there's a lot of variance in what some people think is a light meal Anytime you get fat or protein, that delays stomach emptying, so that's why we go to eight hours. Otherwise, it's something also that when you talk to the patient, I recently had a patient come to pre-op, a pediatric patient, and I asked the dad, when did he last eat? He said, breakfast. Okay, what did he have? Bread. Was there anything on the bread? Follow-up question, right? Some, yeah, there was something, but his mom made it. Okay, I asked mom, what was on there? Peanut butter. Okay, so eight hours. Um, typically, if it's any food, eight hours. Now, this is in healthy people undergoing elective procedures. So this changes in pregnancy as the gravid uterus grows and pushes up, delays emptying, um, pregnant women are typically just considered like they have a full stomach. Um, trauma also delays emptying. History of diabetes because of the resulting gastroparesis and use of opioids. These will all delay emptying time 
So what do you do if the patient is NPO? Well, you can wait. Does this have to go? Is this an emergency? Does it have to be done? You can proceed without sedation and just tell the patient, this is what we're gonna do, you'll, you'll get through it. And offer comfort, calming words, but nothing that would take away the airway reflexes. Or you decrease the level of sedation that is planned to accomplish the procedure. Many times, um, unless it's an emergency, delaying is probably the safest option. So the next the next thing that we're going to talk about is your ASA classification. With increasing ASA status, chances of major morbidity and mortality increase. So ASA1 is a normal healthy patient, minimal alcohol use. ASA2, mild disease without substantial functional limitation. So this could be somebody who is a current smoker, social alcohol use, pregnancy, although not a disease, of course, on its own, but it does induce physiological changes that are not present in a woman who is not pregnant. Obesity, well-controlled diabetes, hypertension, mild lung disease. The obesity is uh, typically a BMI between 30 and 40. Once BMI is over 40, it becomes considered morbid obesity. This puts the patient in ASA 3, so substantial functional limitations, poorly controlled diabetes, poorly controlled hypertension, COPD, active hepatitis, alcohol dependence or abuse, the need for an implanted pacemaker, um, reduced ejection fraction, end-stage renal disease, only if they are on regularly scheduled dialysis. Um, any premature infant under 60 weeks post-conception age, a history of MI, uh, cerebrovascular accident, TIA, or coronary artery disease with stents. ASA 4 puts you into the category of um, severe disease that's an ongoing threat to health. So less than three months out from MI, stroke, TIA, or stents, ongoing cardiac ischemia, severe valve dysfunction, severely reduced ejection fraction, sepsis, DIC, um, or end-stage renal disease not on regular dialysis. ASA 5 is someone who is not going to survive without this intervention. So that is a ruptured AAA um, or severe polytrauma patient. So let's assign ASA status to these patients. So let's say a 14-year-old male who has a history of leukemia presents for lumbar puncture for intrathecal chemotherapy. So this person would be ASA 3. He's got pretty substantial functional limitations without a constant threat to his life. The next one, a 65-year-old woman with end-stage renal disease on dialysis Monday, Wednesday, Friday, fell at home three days ago, breaking her foot, and she has not been get able to get to dialysis because of her pain. So end-stage renal disease alone would make her a three. 
now that she's missed dialysis and at least three days, so she's missed at least one session, she's getting fluid overloaded, she may be becoming hyperkalemic, this makes her a four. Her condition is now a severe, a constant threat to her life. A 27-year-old woman with claustrophobia and asthma controlled with inhalers coming to you for an MRI. We would put her as a stage two or classification two because the asthma is controlled and she has no other no other systemic disease. 40-year-old man with a history of opioid use disorder and hepatitis C, who's in the ER for a wrist fracture. So active hepatitis, substance abuse disorder, this is ASA 3, and lastly, one-year-old term male with a forehead laceration. So this puts him at greater than 60 weeks post-conceptual age. And he's healthy, so he's ASA 1. The next thing that we have to talk about after you have talked with the patient, examined the patient, uh, determined ASA classification, and what level of sedation you're going to administer based on NPO status and based on the patient's health is to get informed consent um, to offer them the risks, benefits, and alternatives. So improved procedural conditions, that means it's going to take less time, patient comfort, and in some instances patient safety because there are some procedures where they need to be as still as they can. The alternative, of course, is to do it with less sedation or no sedation at all. That's a discussion that you have to determine on an individual basis for each individual procedure. Respiratory complications. Um, so you discuss potential for airway obstruction, airway injury. If there's any type of airway support, adding a nasal airway, an oral airway, there's always a potential for injury there, laryngospasm, cardiac complications. Many sedation drugs decrease the systemic vascular resistance, can decrease blood pressure. Um, in someone who is really dependent on, for example, an uncontrolled hypertensive patient who's really dependent on a higher blood pressure for perfusion to the brain, to the heart, to the kidneys. Um, this could lead to issues. Um, seizures and stroke, um, very small risk of, I know we always say, and a very, very tiny risk of death. But it's something to discuss with the patient and document the sedation that discuss the conversation that took place. So in summary, these are the references that I've used. Um, you can check them out, look through all of them, and uh, further lectures in this series will also be based on the practice guidelines for sedation and analgesia by non-anesthesiologists. Please email me, victoria.bradford at uky.edu if there are any questions, concerns, feedback, anything you'd like to discuss further. Thank you so much.